Good morning. I'm dressed in red today. And as you'll see in just a few moments, the sanctuary is dressed in red as well. What's the occasion? It's Reformation Sunday, which begs the traditional Lutheran question, what does this mean? Reformation Sunday is a historical marking of events that happened 503 years ago. Events that led to the Protestant Reformation. Events, indeed, that changed the world. 503 years ago, an Augustinian monk from a small town in Germany by the name of Martin Luther set out to inspire debate among academics and clergy. He hoped that the conversation would bear fruit. He hoped that the debate would reform the church, the church that he loved. He hoped that the church would reclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and that the church would turn from superstition and fear that God's truth would once again set the people of God free. 503 years ago, the church was the most powerful institution in the world. One third of all the land in Europe was owned by the church. The cardinals, the bishops, and the popes, they lived lavishly. Now, Luther visited Rome in 1511 on official church business. When he arrived, St. Peter's Church was just being built. It would be the largest and most expensive church ever built. As Luther observed the construction of St. Peter's, Michelangelo was working just next door painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Luther visited Rome and it changed his life. It seems that Rome was not all that he had imagined it to be. Luther was just another pilgrim coming to the holy city. But Luther was appalled. He was appalled at the commercialization of the church and religion. He saw poor people viewing relics and paying money to escape the wrath of God. Could it be that God was for sale? Luther returned to Germany disillusioned. The church he loved had lost its way. Human institutions and human beings have a tendency to do just that. Prodigal sons sometimes get lost, and prodigal politicians and preachers sometimes lose their way. Churches, political parties, the leaders of movements and elected officials may begin with the purest of intentions, but with the passing of time, they are seduced. They are seduced by wealth, greed, power, and influence. Holding on to what they have becomes more important than the good intentions that once motivated them. 503 years ago, Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg. His sole desire was to spark debate. But as that nail tore through the parchment and securely fastened itself to the wood of the door, the fabric of the most powerful human institution in history was forever torn. Without Luther's knowledge or approval, the newly invented printing presses of Johann Gutenberg laid ink to paper. The words of Luther challenged the Pope, brought into question the use of indulgences, and threatened the money-making schemes of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. They were read and reread. Debate was sparked, and the Reformation spread like wildfire across Europe. Luther would be branded a heretic. He would be tried and found guilty by the Emperor Charles V. Pope Leo X in Rome wanted Luther executed. That's what human institutions do when their power and positions are threatened. So Luther was given a choice. Recant. Take back what you said and take back what you wrote. Admit that you were wrong and the church was right and your life will most likely be spared. But if you do not recant, you can plan on being executed as a heretic 
executed by a church that had no qualms about executing heretics. Luther's response, I cannot and I will not recant of anything, for to do so against conscience is neither right or safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So God help me. Luther would then be kidnapped by those who wished to protect him from the Pope. He would go into a type of witness protection program with a new identity hiding in the Wartburg Castle. Luther would translate the New Testament into German. And for the first time, the common people would hear the stories of Jesus. Those were stories of grace and forgiveness. Those were stories of hope and reconciliation. Stories that cast out fear and superstition. Stories that did not include purgatory or indulgences. Through his study of scripture, Luther came to understand the freeing power of God's grace. God loves us perfectly as a model parent would love their own children. Well, this is probably enough for now. Luther was one of the most prolific writers and hymn writers of his day. And our opening hymn is perhaps the best known of Luther's greatest hits, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So what do you say, Martin Luther, should we go forward for worship? Here I stand, I can do no other. Let us go now.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you are creating and ever creating. Hear now our prayers. Reform our hearts. Reform our church. Reform our country. Reform our world. Inspire us to worship you and inspire us to work for the common good of all people and for the good of all creation. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lois Roth is going to read for us this morning. It is one of the great texts that inspired Martin Luther's understanding of grace. Lois, over to you. The reading is from Romans chapter 3. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith, apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Lois, and our prayers for you and your family, and your boyfriend, Leroy. Carl Olson is going to share a piece of special music with us at this time. Carl? Like 
grace alone we have been saved. All that we are has come from you. Hearts that were once by sin enslaved, now by your power have been made new. Glory Listen now to the words of Jesus from the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The church of the Dark Ages was marked by superstition, half-truths, outright lies. It was indeed a dark period for Europe, one that included a pandemic like the world had never known. The Church of the Dark Ages was marked by fear. The threat of eternal damnation weighed heavily upon the minds of uneducated peasants who could only hope that the world to come would be better than the hell that they were living. The truth will set you free. Let's focus our time on just a few of the key teachings of Martin Luther on this Reformation Sunday. The first is that we cannot earn or buy God's love. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Grace, God's amazing grace saves us. We cannot earn God's grace. We cannot earn God's favor. We cannot earn our own salvation. Now we can choose to love God, but we do not control God. We do not control God's unconditional love for us which leads us to the understanding of our limited free will. Luther taught that we have free will as humans created in the image of God, but our free will is not without limits. We are free to care for our bodies. We are also free to abuse them. We can choose what we eat and how we spend our time. We can choose to forgive or we can choose to hold on to the debts of others. We can choose to honor the vows of marriage, but we are also free to break those vows. We have free will, and that free will brings with it a great deal of responsibility. Every act in our lives bears fruit of some kind. How we exercise our freedom will largely determine the quality of our life and the quality of our relationships here on earth. But our free will has limits. We cannot choose the time of our birth. We cannot escape the decay of our body and our minds that come with aging. And we cannot earn God's favor. We cannot earn God's favor by our good works. We cannot earn our own salvation by coming to church or by coming to Jesus. God's love, God's forgiveness, God's eternal salvation cannot be earned. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. And then there is grace. Luther concluded that if we could earn our own salvation, then the cross was for nothing. If we could earn our own salvation, then we really didn't need Jesus at all. 
Salvation is a gift from God. And any person or any pope or any church that uses salvation or the threat of damnation as a means to manipulate people or to raise money or to build churches is a person or a pope or a church that has lost its way and is in need of reformation. 503 years ago, the world was changed by an Augustinian monk who loved the church and sought to bring it back to the teachings of Jesus. Luther did not set out to be the founder of a new church, not in his wildest dreams. No, Luther set out to reform the church that he loved. But there was no room for such dissent 500 years ago. Luther was excommunicated. He was a wanted man. He was a priest without a church. And so... The Lutherans were the first out the door, leaving the Roman Catholic Church. And right behind them, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Mennonites, the Methodists, and a host of others who would follow suit. This morning, we mark and celebrate the 503rd anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Those who protested against the abuses of the church would change the face of Christianity and the course of human history. This might sound like an exaggeration, but this is not an overstatement. It is not hyperbole at all. The Reformation and the Renaissance marked an end to the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Enlightenment. And finally, our final point One of the cornerstone, earth-shaking teachings of Martin Luther is that of the priesthood of all believers. What is a priest? A priest is one who is ordained to do God's work. A priest takes vows. A priest wakes up each day knowing that holy work awaits them. They are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. They are called and they are chosen. A priest. Now in Luther's day, the church's teaching was quite clear. The priest did God's work in the world. The rest of the people did what they had to do to survive. To put food on the table and to support the work of the priest and the nuns who did God's holy work. The mundane, unclean, and unappreciated work of the lay people was a necessary evil. It was a curse from the fall in the Garden of Eden. It was a punishment for original sin. You will get no rest. You will labor. You will toil doing secular work until the day you die. Only the priest and the nuns do God's holy work. But Luther turned Christianity upside down by teaching that the priest and the nuns were no more important in God's eyes than the blacksmith or the farmer or the mother or the teacher. Luther's teaching on the priesthood of all believers tells us that in baptism we are ordained. We are ordained by God to do holy and sacred work each and every day, every morning, I arise and come to work as your pastor and someone needs me. Yes, I am needed to make coffee, to turn on the heat or the lights, to open the doors of the church, to move tables and chairs, and occasionally to plunge toilets. You see, my work is no different from those at the schools and office buildings across the island and across the country. Each day, people come to me needing prayer or a shoulder to cry on. But each day, people come to you needing someone just to listen to them, someone to care, 
someone to remind them that they are not alone on this journey. Each day I seek to do my work to the glory of God. It is God's work, it is my hands. But each day you go places where I cannot go. Your children and your grandchildren, they need you. They need your love. And your co-workers and neighbors need to hear words of hope and forgiveness and reconciliation from you. And this is not just work. This is God's work. This is holy work. You see, I need you. I need you to build the planes that I fly in. This is holy work done to the glory of God. We need teachers who care about our children, and we need politicians who will work not for themselves, but for the common good. We need bankers and bakers and tellers and ferry workers. You see, you, my friends, are the hands and feet of Christ in the world. You were ordained in baptism to faithfully serve in your vocation. Whatever that vocation is, it is important to your neighbor. It is important to the functioning of society, to the abundant life of our shared community. Your vocation, whatever it may be, is your ministry. And in that place, you are a priest. When parenting has you at wit's end, remember that you were called and chosen for moments just like this. When your clients or coworkers or customers are wearing you down and trying your patience, touch water, any water, make the sign of the cross on your forehead and remember that you were ordained and chosen to be the hands and feet of Christ in moments just like this. God needs you today. Where you are, doing what you do, caring for the sick or children, baking or building, it's a calling. It's God's work. So take a deep breath and then join Martin Luther in saying, may God help me today to be a priest for Jesus Christ in the world. Reformation Day 2020. This isn't just any news. It's the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Carl is going to sing for us at this time. Before there was earth or water or sky, before there was how or where or why, before there was woman, before there was man, before there was no and before there was, oh yes I can, there was the world. Then came creation, then came the fall, then came the flood, and then came the call. Then came the promise, then came the land, and then came captivity, and then came the wilderness path. And there was the Word. And the Word became flesh. And the Word became bone. And the Word became one of us. Some called him Savior. Some called him King. Some called him the one who would change everything. Some call him truth, some call him grace, some call him the light to enlighten the whole human race. And there was the world. And the word became flesh, and the word became turned into right, wherever blindness is turned into sight, 
Wherever death is turned into birth, wherever warfare is turned into peace on this earth, there is the world. And the world became flesh, and the world became We lift our hearts to God in prayer. Our prayer response will be sung. Let us pray. The prayer response today is, God, you are our fortress. We'll sing it twice at the beginning. I'll sing it for you once and then sing it back to me. And then once after each petition of the prayers. God, you are our fortress. God, you are our fortress from the hearts of all your people. Hear our prayer. Sing with me. God, you are our fortress from the hearts of all your people. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all people according to their need. We give you thanks and praise for the privilege of gathering together apart to worship you. May your spirit inspire us and unite us as we care for each other and the world. May we look beyond our differences and join hands in the gospel work that you have entrusted to us. May we show extravagant hospitality to those who are unable to free themselves from the judgment of society. We call upon you now. God, you are our fortress from the hearts of all your people. On this Reformation Sunday, we recognize that the church and society are always in need of reform. We recognize our debt to those who have gone before us. We give thanks for the protests of Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther King Jr., and faithful reformers of every generation. Help us discern those parts of our tradition and serve you that serve you and serve your people and be courageous in determining what to retain and what must be reformed, knowing that your truth will set us free. We pray too for those who have been elected to public office, those who are seeking election, and all who guide and govern. Give them faithful hearts and wisdom as they serve your people. Help us to look beyond party lines to seek the common good for all people. We call upon you now. God, you are our fortress from the hearts of all your people. Hear our prayer. As our country and world struggle with ongoing natural disasters and climate challenges, may we renew our efforts to steward your marvelous creation, especially as it impacts the poor and marginalized close to home and far away. Saved by your grace, let us respond and act in defense to all you have created. We call upon you now. God, you are our fortress from the hearts of all your people. Hear our prayer. We lift up all who have asked for our prayers, remembering especially those who are sick and those nearing death, those who suffer from depression or addiction, and all who are heavy laden with financial troubles. Give comfort and hope to those afflict afflicted. You know their needs. Give us your grace, Lord God, that we might continue to abide in the word made flesh. Give us the courage to follow Jesus Christ in our families, in our workplaces, and in the world. Give us compassion that we may forgive others and give us the courage to forgive ourselves. We call upon you now. from the hearts of all your people. 
For these prayers, and all of these prayers yet unspoken, known only to you, we trust in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share a sign of peace with those far or near this day. God's peace be with you. Just a few announcements today. You'll notice uh, that we are celebrating this month the affirmations of baptisms for our young people. And today at uh, 9 and 11 o'clock, we will have social distance affirmation of baptism services. Our congratulations and appreciation to Carter Castle, Erica McGrath, uh, Gabe Gondarius, Savannah Simmons, McKenna Lane, Michaela Nelson and Ava Stamatio, who will all be affirming their baptisms today. The adult forum this morning at 9.30, join Pastor Dennis as he looks at Lutheran teachings, and Sunday school at 11 a.m. today on Zoom. I want to thank you all for your generous support. We do appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. We are all in this together, and thank you for your prayer support and your financial support as well. We dedicate now our entire lives, our talents, and our time to God as we join Carl in singing together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever, now and forever, amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go out there into the world and make a difference. And as you go forth this day, we have our sending hymn, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Sent forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, the people of God from this dwelling take leave. The supper is ended, oh, now be extended, the fruits of this service in all who believe. The seed of Christ's teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. Your grace shall incite us, your love shall unite us to work for your kingdom and answer your call. With praise and thanksgiving to God ever living, the tasks of our everyday life we will face. Our faith ever sharing, in love ever caring, embracing God's children.
children, the whole human race. With your feast you feed us, with your light now lead us, unite us as one in this life that we share. Then may all the living with praise and thanksgiving give honor to Christ and his name that we bear. Now until next time, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.